Hi, and welcome to A World of Faith, a podcast which brings faith leaders and politicians from all around the world and from every sect together for a dialogue on the practice, the politics, and the philosophy of religion. I'm Michelle Nimi, and I'm an undergraduate student at Harvard University, and I'm fortunate enough to be co-hosting with Syed Ali Abbas Razavi, the Director General of the Scottish Ahl Beit. In this episode, we talk with Professor Cole Durham, the Susan Young Gates University Professor and the Director of the International Centre for Law and Religion Studies at Brigham Young University, as well as the Reverend Professor James Taylor Christie, the former Dean of the Faculty of Theology at the University of Winnipeg. Professor Durham served as the president of the recent G20 Interfaith Forum and Professor Christie as an advisor. We discussed the politics of the G20 Interfaith Forum, how institutional design can accommodate and facilitate religious diversity, and finally, how we might bring adverse actors to the interfaith table. It's our pleasure to be hosting Professor Cole Durham and the Reverend Professor James Christie on this episode of World of Faith. Before we delve into the meat of our discussion on questions like the appropriate settings for interfaith discussion and how institutions may bring to bear on interreligious rapprochement, I'd love to hear from both of you about your own faith traditions and what it is that motivated your work and your journey in interreligious dialogue. You want me to, st- I can start. Uh, uh, so uh, I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I have ancestors who joined the movement in the very early days in the 19th century. I have ancestors who were in the original uh, pioneer party that settled Utah, the original wagon train that came into the valley here. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, uh, this is a, people don't realize that the population of uh, Mormons uh, globally is now roughly the same as Judaism, although we obviously don't have the same length of history. Uh, But uh, I think, uh, as I was telling Michelle, I studied philosophy at Harvard Uh, I've always been interested in religion and law issues. I did philosophy and then then law. And uh, throughout my career, I've focused on uh, freedom of religion or belief issues. And it was uh, sort of a natural uh, jump to integrate that with some of the things that were going on with the G20 when I was pulled into this uh, at the time of the G20 in Australia in 2014. So it's been, a, uh, I, I come at things from the standpoint of comparative constitutional law, from uh, comparative religion, and, uh, and I've learned a lot from people like Jim Christie who come at it more from the interfaith perspective per se. It uh, somehow feels both humbling and even a little intimidating to think that I've had anything that I could impart to Cole, who is very much a leader in what we have been doing for some considerable time now. In terms of personal journeys, um, I had really wanted to be an Air Force pilot, but uh, my eyesight wasn't adequate for that particular vocation in the 1960s, although I understand I could have fit in now and intended instead to go into politics. And as I began taking a look at what it would mean to read constitutional history and law, and uh, to actually engage in the very hard work of becoming a lawyer, Cole, I'm not sure how you managed to even (laughs) do that. Um, I found myself with what we in the Christian tradition call a call to ministry. That probably is due as much as anything else to uh, uh, to both nature and uh, and nurture, um, and uh, was raised within the Anglican tradition, which would be Church of England. However, my family background uh, involves uh, Evangelical Chapel, Church of England, and the Church of Scotland. So I suppose I am a diehard Protestant through and through. When I felt I intended to study 
uh, theology and ultimately to pursue a path to ministry, I had the great good fortune of um, happening to live near enough to go to McGill University and be accepted in the Faculty of Religious Studies there, where my mentors included Presbyterians and Jesuits and um, one of the great opportunities now very nearly 50 years ago was to have been introduced to Judaism by the late Rabbi Harry Joshua Stern, uh, both a Jewish ecumenist and really an advocate for interfaith dialogue and freedom of religion in Canada and worldwide. Um, Harry was only one of the great mentors I had. While I was at McGill, I also had the great privilege of meeting and becoming ultimately a friend and colleague of the late Wilfred Cantwell Smith, who uh, I see uh, Sayed nodding his head at, during his lifetime was considered to be one of the great non-Muslim experts on Islam in the English speaking world. And uh, the influence of people of other faiths, meeting them up close and personal, or as the women's movement has taught us in recent decades, the personal is the political. In my case, the personal was also the road, if not to piety, at least to an understanding of the significance of religious pluralism. And so it's a wonderfully, wonderfully diverse religious world we live in. And uh, candidly, it always puzzles me that human beings have such trouble in their religious life limiting themselves to appreciation of uh, their own tradition when it appears that God enjoys diversity so much more than we do. <laughs> well, there's a great statement on that in the Quran, as I recall. There is one of the most beautiful surahs or passages in many of our traditions. <clears throat> Thank you so much, both Jim and Paul, for that insight into your own journeys. This year, moving on to your work with the G20 Interfaith Forum. The G20 Interfaith Forum is nominally being hosted by Saudi Arabia. Obviously, in light of coronavirus, that has changed to be an online format. But having been organised by King Abdullah bin Abdulaziz International Dialogue Centre, naturally one might be circumspect about a country like Saudi Arabia paying residence to such a pluralistic event like this one, for obvious reasons like the country's civil liberties record, its inflammation of sectarian conflict in its vicinity, and sometimes its clerical denunciation of Shia Muslims. Acknowledging that such decisions often impose challenging trade-offs between inclusivity and salience, what were the inputs into the decision to have Saudi Arabia host the G20 what sort of considerations made it in, in, in both of your experiences? Well, let me uh, begin on that one. Uh, let me just back up a little bit and give you a little history of the G20 Interfaith Forum. Uh, actually, Jim in some ways has even longer history because he uh, goes back to a time when it was just before the G20 existed and when there was work with the G7, the G8, uh, but in 2008, after the crash, the G20 was put together. The G20 is essentially 19 countries plus the EU. So it's the 20 is a little bit of a uh, false advertising. But uh, it, the, G, the G20 does represent something like 80% of the econ economics in terms of gross national product on Earth. And uh, it was the G20 was initially put together as a response to the crash in 2008, and it was an effort by finance people to try and arrange things in the global economy so this wouldn't the 2008 crash wouldn't recur. But what's happened over the last decade or so is that more and more attention is paid to uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals. I came into the process in uh, when Australia was the host country, and we put together the first uh, G20 interfaith uh, summit, as we called it in the early days. We've shifted to calling it that, an annual forum. Uh, and uh, in terms of how, how this works, uh, we don't have a lot of choice on who, how the G20 process works. Essentially, 
Each year, there is a new country. One of the G20 countries serves as the host country. This rotates through the countries. Uh, and uh, so in the years uh, I've been involved with the G20, we had first uh, Australia, then Turkey, uh, then, uh, let's see, then China, then Germany, then uh, uh, Argentina, uh, then Japan, and this year, uh, Saudi Arabia. So uh, from our perspective, working on the Interfaith Forum, what our aim has been is to help integrate religious voices from the broad diversity of religions on earth into the high-level policy formation processes that go on in the G20. Uh, this provides uh, a very significant platform. Uh, there are uh, opportunities as we distill recommendations each year. These get reached on to those who are uh, the, 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 the country leaders for the G20 countries. Uh, some, some leaders are more open to recommendations than others. You could imagine what that's uh, like. Uh, think of particular leaders of prominent countries that we know. Uh, but whether, whether or not uh, the recommendations sink in directly into the minds and hearts of the G20 leaders, this is a phenomenal platform because it brings people together from many walks of life, from many uh, areas of society. And, and our aim has really been to help facilitate a channel in this process for, for religious actors. And all too often, that is a voice that is left out of global policy making. But especially when one is focusing on the sustainable development goals, the 17 uh, sustainable development goals that the UN has promulgated. Uh, if you look at those goals, things like eliminating poverty, raising the quality of education, uh, work on the environment, uh, uh, I could go through the full 17, but most of these, uh, to imagine that major progress is going to be made without input from the religious sector seems, seems very naive. So now to your question, which is more, uh, what, what have we experienced with Saudi Arabia in this process? Obviously, Saudi Arabia is uh, different. There, there are, this year, there are uh, non-governmental organizations, civil society organizations that have consciously decided not to uh, participate in the process this year. Uh, as an interfaith group that is uh, committed to pluralism and so forth, we felt we couldn't simply skip this year. Uh, and we've been grateful to be able to find partners that, that have made it uh, possible to work. If we had been able to have a physical meeting, this would have been very historic because we probably, the Saudi leaders would have been inviting religious leaders from more religious traditions into their country than had ever been there at once. Uh, and so uh, this was an opportunity to increase inclusion. Uh, the inclusion is not total. If you had an Israeli passport, you couldn't get into Saudi Arabia. Uh, but, uh, but on the other hand, uh, Jewish uh, religious leaders have been welcome and, and so on. So, so we faced some, some trade-offs, uh, uh, but uh, on balance, our sense has been that if we want to really uh, engage in the interfaith world, uh, we really need to engage with Saudi Arabia, and we've been grateful for good partners that have helped us do that. Jim, you could add from your perspective, obviously, how you've seen this. Well, thank you, Cole. I, perhaps I could begin, first of all, by saying that uh, I have been very privileged to have friends both in the Sunni community, but uh, also, frankly, in the Shia community. Uh, 
and um, one of my uh, my treasured contacts, colleagues, and acquaintances is, in fact, a fairly senior official in Iran, of whom I'm very fond and for whom I have enormous respect. So I feel very much uh, connected to and appreciative of the, the richness of uh, the Muslim experience in myriad forms, uh, including Ismaili. Uh, so setting that just as a bit of context, uh, let me also note that for the past six years, I have been the chair of the management committee of Project Plowshares. Now this is the Canadian iteration spelled the correct way call, P-L-U-G-H-S-H-A-R-E-S, -E and not to confuse it with the Plowshares Foundation based in New York. Plowshares is uh, the Peace Research Institute of the Canadian Council of Churches and is about to go into its 45th year. Although much of its work has been engaged in issues of nuclear disarmament and uh, Plowshares is, for example, a member organization of the ICANN network, which received the Nobel in 2017. Um, Plowshares for the last six years, in terms of one of its principal files, has actually, well, has, has been in an almost invidious position with relation to Saudi Arabia. In January of 2015, uh, Project Plowshares and the Globe and Mail, which styles itself Canada's national newspaper, broke a curious story about first the Harper government and subsequently, of course, the Trudeau Liberal government, um, engaging in what can only be described as an unholy agreement to provide Saudi Arabia with $15 billion of LAVs, Canadian-made light armored vehicles. Prime Minister Harper tried to dismiss these as Jeeps. They aren't Jeeps, they are killing machines is what they are. Uh, even my own brief period in the armed forces when I was much younger can uh, tell me the difference between a Jeep and a miniature and fairly light tank. Uh, we, um, we have publicly been on the record uh, as being enormously concerned about the use to which these weapons might be put by the Saudi government. And when uh, the G20 was to be convened uh, under the presidency of Saudi Arabia in Riyadh, uh, we were faced with a decision as plowshares as to whether to participate or not. A number of other very senior Canadian non-governmental organizations had made the decision quite swiftly not to, including, for example, the Canadian iteration of Amnesty International. However, uh, our governing committee uh, and the Canadian Council of Churches, by extension, and our executive director decided that it was our responsibility to participate, even though we had been publicly on the out, as it were, with the Saudi regime and the Canadian government over this particular deal and others uh, for some years. And the reasoning was quite simple. To borrow from the late Yitzhak Rabin, you don't make, uh, you don't make peace with your friends. And in our case, we translated that to mean if we aren't at the table, if we aren't finding a way to talk and to engage, there will simply be no movement forward. Now, I should say, too, that implicitly there is another issue within the um, Christian Midrash that is the New Testament in the, uh, uh, in the Bible of the Christian world, and which is appreciated, of course, in the Islamic world as well. There is a parable of Isa in the eighth chapter of the Gospel according to John, the famous line which emerges from which is, uh, the one who is without a sin casts the first stone. And when we consider the reality of the Canadian experience, and uh, we recognize that Canada is often seen as a kind of model society, uh, like Scandinavia, only much colder, uh, we, uh, we also had to realize that our own record was not so stellar as the world often sees it to be. There was, as I mentioned, this $15 billion weapons deal with the Saudis, which we were retaining, not because it in fact broke both Canadian and international law. And uh, there is a private um, legal action being taken by a professor of law at McGill University against the government of Canada for pursuing the deal. 
But beyond that, our record with our own indigenous peoples suggests that our understanding as a society in Canada of human rights has certain limits, and quite clearly that limit, uh, even though things are beginning to improve, has for a century and a half meant excluding Indigenous peoples from the main uh, stream of Canadian life. And even within this last year, in the wake of Black Lives Matter, uh, while just a few weeks before George Floyd was murdered by police in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, the, one of the most respected police forces in the world, was busy shooting Indigenous women, in one case, at a health center. The uh, commissioner of the RCMP uh, claimed publicly that there was no systemic racism in the force and was contradicted immediately in public by the prime minister. And uh, we recognize, quite frankly, that we're no more perfect than any other um, agglomeration of human beings that come together as a, as a nation state. So in addition to Cole's quite correct assessment of the realities, we honestly, as Canadian NGO leaders and religious leaders, uh, are not quite so convinced that we are without sin and are not prepared to cast too many stones. Good point. So Jim said earlier that the pursuit of reconciliation, reinforced at the end, mm. entreats some form of engagement, entreats compromise, and also a mutual acknowledgement, willingness to acknowledge that there is fault on both sides. And obviously there's a broader question at play here about what the parameters around dialogue and attempts of rapprochement ought to look like. Because evidently, the absence of dialogue can serve as a deterrent, as a powerful instrument in and of itself. Dialogue itself can be a sing signal of goodwill, a signal of that willingness to compromise, as Jim just expatiated upon. For you, where do these boundaries lie, or where might we start in passing out these boundaries, speaking more viscerally to your experience as a religious leader of a religious minority which often finds itself in a persecuted position. So thank you very much, um, and especially for that question. You know, it's, uh, it's always interesting that when you meet people for the first time, you always try and link things together. So I remember being with Professor Durham in Buenos Aires and Geneva. And of course he has a law background and as do I. And then after that, the talk of Montreal came in and I spent some wonderful days and weeks in Montreal, um, especially going to look at some of the uh, original works of Toshiko Zitsu uh, at McGill. So it was quite, it's quite interesting. And then of course, the mention of the Presbyterians of course, the Church of Scotland are very close to us. And it, I think on a regular basis, on a daily basis, we're in touch. The same thing with the Anglican Church here in Scotland. As you know, we have the Primus. So it's, it's very interesting that we start building connections together. And so I'm very happy just to listen. But now that you have asked me a question, I think it's so important that I should reply. And I think that every case is different. Every case is very unique. I don't think there's a template as such. And as you know, for example, at this moment in time, target killings of Shias have begun in Pakistan. Yesterday, two Shias were shot dead. Um, the day before that, there was an attack on a mosque. Uh, the day before that, there was a huge rally of over 100,000 people declaring that Shia blood was lawful to be shed. So when you are seeing these kind of things take place, our question really was that should we continue to dialogue in Pakistan? Mm. And we believe that it's very important for us to dialogue. We believe that when you isolate certain communities, um, especially certain radical communities, support for them may increase if you don't put your side of the argument forward. And especially if I take the case of Pakistan, where the vast majority of Sunnis are quite moderate, um, but if allowed, and if Shias do go silent and stop engaging, what you will find is that you'll find an acceleration of support. And I believe that's started now in the last month or so. Uh, 
do we stop dialoguing with the government? No, we don't. We're still dialoguing with the Prime Minister um, and various communities of religious leaders. So that's one example. Go to India. Do we stop dialoguing there? Well, I don't feel that we should. And if we were to take this example, let's say of the G20, by proxy, uh, the fact is, is that if the G20 does go to Saudi Arabia, well, as, as a G20 interfaith forum, you've got to engage in. I don't believe that any country should be politically isolated um, as it stands. I think that dialogue is very important. I think the door for dialogue needs to be open. There are cases where, as protest, one could, uh, and as you've heard, some of the human rights organizations have taken a step back. But that, does that mean that countries take a step back? Countries are not moral entities. They may be more moral than others, but countries or nation states are there to protect their interests. And we've got to look at it through that paradigm. So we may have human rights organizations who would take a step back, and I would expect them to do so. There may be certain religious organizations who should and would do. But at the same time, do we cut all ties? I don't believe so. I think that there are opportunities, even in the worst cases, for people to dialogue, for people to speak, and for people to try and solve their issues. I think the minute that we start or we stop talking, it becomes a huge problem in and of itself. And you'll see certain things then accelerate. And even though sometimes it may seem, and this is again generic, I'm not looking at any one case, but sometimes it may seem that it's an uphill battle, but I think it's very important to dialogue. I think if, for example, this particular G20 forum would have happened or it is happening virtually, again, we have an argument to say that no mainstream Shia was invited, um, though there may be one or two Shia representations, which I've seen uh, in certain emails, but the fact of the matter is no mainstream Shia um, was invited and that's fine. They don't need to be invited. The fact is, is that there is a dialogue taking place and, um, and that dialogue is important. And I feel that every case is unique. You've got to take in political, social um, considerations, economic considerations. And because we're living in a world which is very fast moving, if you go back a year ago, the world was completely different. In fact, before COVID-19, the world was very diff different. How things have accelerated now, how things have changed, how things are changing, and how we must adapt is very important. And so I think strategy needs to change to adapt to a world which is fast moving. In a global village, there's a lot of misinformation as well. And for the vast majority of people, people are good people, regardless of which country they live in. I believe the right messaging, the right message needs to go forward. And if a person, let's say, for example, in a particular given situation, pulls their hand back, for the vast majority of people, that isn't a positive step. If a person is on the table, they have an opportunity to express their desires or their wants or their side of the argument. But look, in conclusion, it's not as easy as saying these are the parameters. I think every case is very unique. I think every situation is a very unique situation. There must be dialogue at some level, be it officially or unofficially. But to take everything off the table, I don't think that there is any country in the world at the moment, regardless of how they manifest themselves outwardly, who have taken everything off the table. If you look at some of those countries who are against each other, the loggerheads, privately, be it in Oman, in Muscat, for example, other places of the world, they're still dialoguing. That dialogue is still strong. You'd be surprised that two countries who may not have any diplomatic relationships at all, but they are still dialoguing in certain parts of the world and we are privy to that information. So I think that this dialogue needs to continue, conversation needs to be there, and diplomacy needs to prevail. Otherwise, we have a very unstable world. Thank you. <clears throat> I find it interesting to say that you did use the language, essentially, of incentive alignment for nation states, and essentially nation states optimize based on an internal endogenous set of factors. And, the question that sort of brings about in my mind is that dialogue is almost always going to be within the incentives of a given country or a given body because there's no credible commitment that necessarily emerges out of dialogue. It doesn't force you 
to take a certain course of action. If anything, it endears you, it ingratiates you, it makes you seem, particularly on the world stage, like you are a, an amenable actor and allows you to frame out other actors who may be less willing to come to the table. So from that perspective, it may be necessary to participate in dialogue just to signal that you are willing to be part of that sort of discussion in the first place. But I'm also interested about this question of whether or not it's possible to frame interfaith in more instrumental terms. Because a lot of the conversation around interfaith, interreligious dialogue is about human dignity, acknowledging fundamental rights, but the very incentives analysis is one that usually prevails for nations, that often there are irreconcilable tensions within the country, power struggles, whatever it may be, which force you away from taking the active steps which are productive, the interreligious interfaith dialogue. So perhaps I might ask this to, to Cole and Jim first. Do you see there being some sort of need for interfaith, interreligion to justify itself instrumentally, tangibly, rather than relying on questions of either deontological ethics or religious ethics, whatever it may be? Well, I, th I think certainly as a practical matter, uh, being engaged in the G20 interfaith process, uh, one of the things that we are conscious of is, uh, well, I suppose the instrumental pragmatic notion of by their fruits ye shall know them. Uh, if we can find ways to draw people together and then find ways that that can uh, have practical imp impact on policy formation, uh, that, that does seem useful. And, and I think there you have to reach out as broadly as you can. I ha have to say, uh, it's not always easy. I think uh, I can tell you we have actually tried uh, to reach out to the, uh, the Shia world as well as the Sunni world. Uh, it's a little more complex doing that from with Saudi Arabia, and I'm, I'm not sure. I, c I can't remember. English names, let alone Arabic and, and uh, so odd names. But so I, I can't give you chapter and verse right now, but I do know that there is an effort. And I think, but I think that's very important. But what's additionally important is often uh, uh, what, what I'm conscious of is that religious voices will have impact, credibility, trust, uh, insight networks, all of these things that uh, the, that the public officials, if they are cut off from that resource, cannot be nearly as effective as they might otherwise be. So I, in, in the last analysis, I'm someone who is really uh, thinks about things in terms of intrinsic values and so forth, as opposed to instrumentalization. But I think uh, in the world of uh, high-level policy, you have to be able to show that you have credible information, that you have uh, credible things that can be done, and, and that that affects uh, your ability to interact with each other and with, with the world. Thank you, Cole, and uh, thank you, Michelle, for the question. Thank you, too, for your response to the earlier question, Syed. I found that extremely encouraging as well as, as, well as helpful. To frame this in terms of context, we sometimes forget just how new serious interreligious dialogue is. Um, when I consider the history of, uh, say, the Christian approach to interreligious dialogue, moving from a kind of um, a classic approach of a religionist of the 19th century or an orientalist, God help us, as uh, that particular discipline once called itself, uh, to where we are today in the G20, for example, th these, these are like two different worlds completely. I well recall back in 1984, uh, Hans Kung, of the, well, of Vatican Council fame, and then of perhaps some discordant uh, relationships with, uh, with Rome, was asked by Canadian broadcaster Peter Zosky what he thought posterity's view of the 20th century would be. 
Now, this is 1984, really not all that long ago. And uh, Kuhn paused for a moment and he said, I think that generations to come will look back at the 20th century and remember not so much the genocides, the wars, the gulags, but rather that this was the first moment in human history when the world's great religions first began to talk to one another. Now, from an historical point of view, that would need to be somewhat nuanced, but there is much to be said for that. One of the strengths of the G20 initiative uh, and the G8 initiative before it is in fact that it was a new kind of thing under the sun, <clears throat> that uh, Suleiman of Israel wasn't always absolutely right, no matter his vaunted wisdom, when he claimed that there was no such thing. When we take a look at the G8 and G20, this was an attempt to find amongst religious leaders a new way to speak to the political establishment of a significant part of the world. Neither overly diffident on the one hand, nor uh, combative about religious principles on the other. And when we chose in 2007 at the time, the Millennium Development Goals as the content of our meetings, and since, of course, 2014 with the G20, that has been uh, translated into the Sustainable Development Goals. But when we picked the Millennium Development Goals, we saw it, um, well, I saw it, as finding a kind of Rosetta Stone so that we had, could have a common language with the political and economic elites, because they are political and economic elites, uh, for the, the sake of humanity. In some ways, um, of course, we'll never know entirely how we succeed, but the um, G8, G20 research team at the Monk Center, the Monk School of International Affairs in Toronto, one of the world's most significant and certainly the most focused in its research on G8, G20, has been convinced that we've had an instrumental value, even though that wasn't our primary intent. The argument that they use, first of all, is that in some instances, they have been able to track what they believe is an increased um, compliance with MDGs and SDGs that they noticed in uh, that famous now up, uh, COVID term uptick, at least in compliance. But more importantly, it has meant that there are on the agendas of the G20, no longer strictly economic issues, no longer strictly political issues, but also the inherent social benefits of the, uh, of the, the G, um, of, of the, the G20's insistence on the adherence to and achieving of the, the SDGs. Perhaps I could put it in terms of a, uh, <clears throat> a personal anecdote. Like Cole, I'm convinced that there is intrinsic worth in, this, in, in dialogue. Without dialogue, there is no groundwork or foundation uh, in order to have an impact on the, uh, the real politic of the G20 or of the whole global community, if you will. But um, when I completed five years as a Dean of Theology, a standard term for a Dean in my university, the university had to decide what actually to do with me as I moved into uh, assuming my role as rank um, and, and of rank and tenure at the university. Now, there were several areas that I could have worked or taught in, but in a moment of pique with a colleague who was attempting to be a tad facetious about the nature of dialogue theology, I was challenged to define it. And I said that dialogue theology is the art and discipline of bringing Christian theology into deliberate dialogue with other religions and disciplines for the sake of mending the world. Now, the University Senate, not known for uh, its necessarily high applied ideals, liked it and much to my surprise decided to name me the professor of whole world ecumenism and dialogue theology, which had never existed at my university before. And of course, now that I've retired, it may never exist again. But it is a, um, it's a sign that there's a recognition that this mending of the world, and Cole alluded to this in principle in his earlier remarks, is simply not going to happen without the engagement of religious communities and as many religious communities as possible and as are willing to engage in them.
thank you for that answer, Jim. And we've considered in the past 40 or so minutes interreligious dialogue at this more meta macro level. I think perhaps it's worth also shedding light on the minutia of that dialogue. So you spoke to the fact of there being political and economic elites with whom religious leaders ought to be able to converse. What I find interesting is that in certain faith traditions and certainly in specific states, religious leaders themselves are imbibed with that economic and political power. And I've always wondered whether interfaith environments in that sense are reflective of power dynamics that exist outside of those interfaith environments. And I ask to all of your experiences actually going to interfaith forums, interreligious forums, whether you can see any of the external dynamics sort of play out within the microcosm of an interfaith G20 convention, for example, or any sort of meeting you may have between different members of different faith traditions in this way. And I'm happy for this to be more of an anecdotal answer in the sense of what you've encountered, perhaps imam, as, as we mentioned before, being from a faith tradition which is often marginalized. Have you ever had a set of presuppositions going into conversations in the interfaith dialogue? Do you find that interfaith spaces, which are explicitly there for interreligious dialogue, are more equalizing or that those asymmetries which are imprinted on the outside world still exist? What's your experience of these spaces? I think it's very unique. There's no one answer to this. Um, sometimes you do go into a conversation and you realize that the people you're having a dialogue with have these prejudice um, and they may f flap their wings trying to find some kind of a link. And you don't blame them at all for that, but there are these kind of like presupposed ideas. And it's, it's fascinating to see many a time that somebody will try and make a link and, you know, somebody will, you know, let's, for example, drop the Iran thing, bearing in mind the vast majority of Shia is actually not from Iran. So, for example, there's, there's, there's more Shias in the subcontinent than there are in Iran and Iraq put together. So sometimes you do get things like that, which are quite fascinating for me to listen to. And, and I appreciate that completely because you, you could see that people are trying. You know, I'll give you three examples of I do feel that a lot of the interfaith now is not just to do with interfaith. There's a lot of social, economic and political activities which are also taking place. Um, very recently, I say recently, going back a year and a half to two years ago, when there was an issue of circumcision in Iceland, um, the Conference of European Churches, ourselves, and the Board of Deputies and the European Jewish Congress, we got together. And in fact, within the space of about three hours to four hours of discussion, we actually had that bill repealed. So in Iceland, had that gone through, they would have set a precedence and it would have become very difficult because as you know, when one kind of domino falls, then the other one was kosher and halal meat. And though we had an interest in that as Jews and Muslims, but it was actually the Christians who supported us and helped us um, and got us together and actually got us to Iceland and there we were a coordinated move. And that was very political. And I find that's the first time I think in European history after World War II, that something like that has happened where three Abrahamic faiths, their leaders have come together in Iceland and coordinated um, to repeal a bill. And it was very open. It wasn't the fact that we were going through proxies. It was the fact that these are religious leaders who came in, who had a conversation, who brought their experts forward, who had this discussion. And I remember um, at the time, an individual stood up and he said, are you telling us that religions have no space anymore in Europe? Because if you go back to 1939, there was somebody else who was saying that there was no space for Jews, for example, in Europe. And the discussion in the way that it developed completely changed the mind frame of many of the MPs who were sitting there at the time. So that's, that's one example where you find three religions can come together on a micro level. And next week we'll have uh, the former president of Ireland, Mary MacLeese, who's going to be on the show. And you can ask her that question. And, and you know, we've had many hours discussing the Good Friday Agreement. Now, the Good Friday Agreement essentially is what? It is intrafaith. Who are they? Catholics on the one side, Protestants on the other. This open door policy whereby representations from two faiths, were, well, two intra faith, so to speak, we're able to come together to dialogue, to be able to pull off something like that is phenomenal. Now, of course, all of these have political, social, economic 
um, and other cultural baggages as well. But on the face of it, this was really an intra-faith agreement that took place based upon covenants. It was really a modern day covenant. And I find that wherever you have these covenants, these theological covenants, it works. Uh, if you look at Europe, for example, where you had Catholics and Protestants warring once upon a time, the solution was covenants. The idea that each one of our faith has a mechanism for reconciliation. And I find that we can use this as well. You know, I remember many years ago, David Ford and I and Peter Oakes and others, we were actually at Cambridge University having a discussion on the idea of covenants. And covenants here is di different from what we would look at as covenants and law. A theological covenant essentially was this, and this is the idea that was come up with, that within every single faith, there is a methodology of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. If each of those methodologies are brought forward, right? So I'll give you an example of the way that the UN works now. Let's say, for example, there's an issue in Sudan, the UN go and there's two sides which are fighting. When as a third person, you're going to reconcile two people, what happens? Immediately, both parties feel oppressed in some shape or form because both have to compromise. It becomes like a spring. It never works. In the 20th century, in, since the creation of the UN, it's never worked. Eventually, what happens is that you're basically feeling oppressed. You're feeling that you have to compromise the spring, board effect, and it comes back again and war begins again. The idea of religious covenants is so profound. The reason being is this, is that we are not coming in as a third person. Each faith, each denomination, each sect has their own methodology of reconciliation. What you're doing is you're binding them morally to say that you must follow your strand of reconciliation. And I find that that covenant was used in the Good Friday Agreement, of which, as you know, David Ford is Irish, the Reg former Regis Professor of Divinity, Protestant uh, professor. And it was really a development from his ideas with discussions with other religious leaders at the University of Cambridge, of which I was also privileged to be a part of at the time within the dialogue that saw these idea of covenants come forward. And of course, Rabbi Sachs and the former Pope and others have also talked about the idea of covenants, but you can see it works. It works there. You know, to give you another example, so we could go into the SDGs in the last four or five months. I also happen to be an international trustee of Religions for Peace. So in the last couple of months, we've been looking at supporting um, communities in Africa. There's been a pot of money there for people in Africa who have been suffering under COVID-19. The influence in the last couple of months that I've seen with religious leaders through, for example, a Religions for Peace in collaboration with the United Nations and the Secretary General has been quite profound. You know, I also happened to sit on the Multi-Faith Advisory Council for the United Nations. So we've been, and half of them probably also are part of Religions for Peace. So the way these two bodies have come together to help people who have been suffering is, has been quite profound. And then you've got the question, for example, of climate change. And I find an interfaith, um, kind of like a, uh, one would say, strategy has been quite beneficial. And I think only a couple of weeks ago, um, in India, for example, they had a meeting um, with the likes of Shri Shri Ravi Shankar. You had our friend Salman Chishti was on uh, the call as well. Um, you had other faith leaders from the Dharmic faiths. Uh, to plan to strategize a strategy for climate change. So what we're finding is that there are multiple causes which go to the root of humanity. So they're not theological. Sometimes theology may create difference, if not within a, a particular space. Theology isn't for everyone. It's not for the vast majority. It's for theologians, be it Christian, Jew, Muslim, or whoever you may be. And that's why it worked a thousand years ago in Cairo, in Aleppo, in, for example, Baghdad, it worked. It worked when Jews, Christians, Muslims got together, theologians, to have dialogue in terms of theology. In the 21st century, though, if we want to make it more open and broader, you've got to look at those things which matter. For example, let's say it, homelessness, climate change, refugees. There's a new refugee council a couple of days ago that's come into existence uh, for the United Nations, which has faith leaders on it. And the purpose of that is that faith leaders can contribute in helping this refugee where 80 million people have been displaced for one reason or another in the world, across the world. So I do find that where in the 20th century, religion was off the table, something very tertiary. I feel that religion is now coming back and religion is playing a central role and it's playing a central role both on the global stage and in international spheres, in organizations such as the EC.
at the United Nations level. And as you can see in other parts of the world, it's also now playing a frontline role. How influential religious leaders are? Well, in theory, they're very influential, but we'll see how things evolve because again, it's, it's at the moment in its infancy. So just to conclude, I do feel that religions can play a huge role. Religious leaders also can do. Interfaith isn't linear. It's not just about theological discussion. It's not just scriptural reasoning where we open up all of our books and have a discussion on a verse of the Old Testament on you or the Quran, for example. It's much more than that. I think it's about humanity. And there are serious questions within humanity that need to be tackled. There are serious things that appeal to all of humanity, not just people of faith, but people of no faith. And this is where I think religions can be very effective. Yeah, I would just say briefly, uh, one of the things that I have been struck by, I've learned a lot, learned from working with uh, leaders from other countries, is not just dialogue, but diapraxis. That is finding ways, finding common issues that you can work on together. Uh, I think as much as one learns uh, respect from uh, what the Imam just spoke of in terms of scriptural reasoning, reading common passages, etc., or explaining beliefs, uh, a huge amount is learned by working with other people. Uh, in our tradition, uh, we just we now have uh, sort of sort of a helping hands tradition. If you see a, a hurricane happens, you will see uh, a large group of people from surrounding regions that will come in to help clear away rubbish, uh, cut down fallen trees, etc. Uh, I, I think uh, at global levels there are things like the rainforest initiative where people work together. But so one of the powers of religious networks is they reach down to the individual community, the individual home, the individual neighborhood. And part of the power is learning how to identify concrete issues and work on them with other people. It's that simple, uh, but it's uh, where a lot of the real power comes from. It's, it's not just a jet set dialogue group, but it's a uh, ways that we can find uh, at the community level to work together, uh, to learn about each other, uh, really by working shoulder to shoulder and learning, learning the real way to respect the dignity of other human beings. The fact that they'll have different approaches, different concerns, but that you can work together as human beings. In listening to uh, both Syed and Cole and Michelle, I, I, I have this moment of wishing that uh, I were a Black Baptist in the United States of America because my friends in Black Baptist congregations still celebrate what they call an Amen Corner. And I would want to say Amen both to Syed and Cole. But that is not, obviously, as you can see, my, my tradition. But, um, but I couldn't agree more with the observation of working together, diapraxis as being important. And that the essential, the, the only quibble I might make with Syed's observation is that I think these common human issues are inherently theological. But when we try to talk about them in theological terms, we lose most sane and, and normal people. So it's, it's better to <laughs> get on and, and give up. To give you, uh, you mentioned anecdotes were useful here. So let me provide one, maybe two. One is very much local. In 2012, the city of Winnipeg, which is very much in the heart of the continent, um, and uh, not only in the heart of the country, but in the heart of North America. I see Syed nodding. I suspect he's been there in January, which is a challenging thing to do. Uh, <laughs> teaching, working as dean there. Um, appointed for the first time in Canadian history, a black police chief, Jamaican born, worked his way up through the ranks as a constable and ultimately, and police chaplain, and ultimately became police chief. His name is uh, Devon Clunas, no longer chief, but he created an absolute media storm on uh, the day of his appointment when he asked the religious communities in Winnipeg, all of them, to pray for it. And the next thing you know, we had journalists who 
So I'm, I have the greatest respect for journalists, but at least some journalists, like all of us, have occasionally been educated beyond our intelligence. And in this particular <laughs> case, uh, there was an absolute firestorm from journalists who claimed that he was breaching the uh, divide, the uh, separation of church and state. Now, the first thing that makes that ridiculous is that he wasn't. The second thing is that Canada has no church-state divide. It's simply not part of our constitutional reality. Um, although I would suspect that the Prime Minister Trudeau Payer, one of the most religious prime ministers in Canadian history, uh, demonstrated that divide better than certain, um, say, elected leaders of our neighbors to the immediate south. But that's besides the point. What uh, Devon did was gather the interfaith community in Winnipeg uh, through a number of gatherings because the north end of Winnipeg and the area in which uh, Devon grew up when his family came from Jamaica was and is a pretty tough neighborhood. Now, Syed, if you've been to Winnipeg, you'll, you'll know the stories of the North End. He got an interfaith team to go out and help the locals clean up the neighborhood, to scrub graffiti, graffiti or to paint over it. The Salvation Army sent out their street kitchen to make sure that uh, those who volunteered from all the faith communities could be fed during the course of the day and the local kids could be fed as well. It was a marvelous day repeated a couple of times while Devon was chief. Very modest thing, but a very, very local thing. The other of a more international scope was an initiative of a Canadian military chaplain in the former Yugoslavia in the mid-90s. His name is, um, well, the full title, I think, would be uh, the uh, Reverend Major Dr. Stephen Moore. And the uh, program he developed was called and is called uh, Religious Leaders Engagement and is now spreading to military chaplaincies in a number of nations. The Canadian military uh, was amongst those who first engaged, uh, and the term chaplain is still used by the armed forces in Canada, rather than say spiritual care providers, which is used in civilian life. But it included uh, Jewish chaplains, Muslim chaplains, and the concept was really quite simple. It's one of those no-brainers that you wonder why more people didn't see earlier. In the former Yugoslavia, we had Muslims and Christians often at each other's throats. There were terrible things that happened there, including effectively genocides of limited numbers in comparison to Rwanda or uh, the Shoah, but genocides nevertheless. Stephen and his team of chaplains got local religious leaders together. And their conversation, to be anecdotal, went something like this. Look, fellas, if this were burnt grass Saskatchewan, we know that you'd have very limited influence. But this isn't. It's the former Yugoslavia. You got a lot of influence. So, in the words of Eldridge Cleaver, you want to be part of the problem or do you want to be part of the solution? And fascinatingly enough, each local religious leader in the former Yugoslavia uh, in the Bosnia campaign said, you know, we'd like to be part of the, we'd like to be part of the solution. And on the ground, peace building began there between secularists and among secularists, amongst religionists of different traditions. And that particular model has been translated among other places to Afghanistan, to parts of Sub-Sahara Africa. And it is rapidly becoming not simply a useful practice for military chaplains, but is beginning to morph into military doctrine and, uh, and military policy. Thank you everyone for both their anecdotal and analytical remarks there. I am wary of time, but I do want to recapitulate perhaps a remark that Syed made earlier about religious covenants in these last few minutes and religious covenants being an explicitly faithful mechanism by which to reach into political tension mm -hmm. and disunity. Often we want or need a, a blunt or a more direct, more secular, more immediate mechanism to attenuate or recover from conflict and perhaps transition into these softer forms of reconciliation or cultivate a space for diapraxis, as Cole mentioned earlier. Cole, you've been involved in drafting constitutions in such ethno-religiously strained areas as Iraq and mm -hmm. Eastern Europe. The model of power-sharing democracy, which is either implicitly or explicitly beset many of these post-conflict states, has come under immense scrutiny, 
not the least because it's associated in states like Lebanon and Iraq with the consolidation of sectarianism, but also with clientelistic vote buying, inefficient economic markets, all of the other corollaries that we sort of referenced before. How might we appraise the failure of power sharing agreements and bringing about enduring democratic transitions? Or maybe even more broadly, think about the sorts of institutional legal architectures which may complement the sort of dialogue that we want to promote and which we've discussed in the previous 15 minutes of this conversation. Well, that's, of course, a huge question of political theory and uh, uh, comparative constitutional law. Uh, I, I guess I, I'm, I'm thinking of the experience uh, with the drafting of the Iraq Constitution, where you, ha where you clearly had uh, different religious elements that, that needed to be brought together and who had to figure out how they were going to split the oil resources of the country. <laughs> I mean, it was not, uh, it was not uh, an easy problem. There, there is this sense that federalism can, uh, can provide solutions, and, and I think that uh, that is often the case there's a major center of federalism in Canada that was drawn on heavily by constitutionalists around the world. Uh, one of the difficulties is that it's often easier to split up than to actually find effective ongoing ways uh, to, work, to work together. Uh, I, uh, and this, you know, in the interest of time is there, there's not enough that, that can be said. I mean, there are risks of trying federalist approaches symbolized by the disintegration of Czechoslovakia. That was the first uh, constitutional move after the collapse of communism that started to raise questions about the federalist kind of approach. We witnessed the very painful disintegration of Yugoslavia. Uh, continuing down into just a decade ago with the final split of Montenegro and Serbia. Uh, uh, I, th I think what is uh, really needed is finding ways to, to build trust. Uh, and what people really need is to know that their dignity will be protected. Uh, you do not, to have a stable society, you do not need a homogeneous society, which is what was thought uh, after Westphalia. What you need is a society, this is one of the reasons why freedom of religion uh, is so important, because it provides a basis for letting people know that their belief systems, whether secular or religious, will be respected and that the core of human dignity will be respected. Now, dignity gets mobilized in all kinds of ways these days. Uh, every side wants to claim that they're the ones protecting dignity. But one of the things about the idea of dignity is that it is ennobling, it has religious roots, it has secular roots, but it calls people to see their own worldview in terms that can be respectful of others and can call for respect. And it is by learning to sort of guarantee that respect. That's the starting seed from which stability has to grow. And that's one of the reasons that interreligious dialogue is important because it teaches people that they can respect to each other. It reminds them of the uh, call to dignity. Wording may be different, but it's in different traditions. And, and that is what, uh, if, if we can't uh, find ways to build on that, then we have then we have to lose all hope. But I think there's no reason to lose hope because uh, we we recognize dignity. We recognize the dignity of difference, but we recognize the depth of dignity, and that uh, can help. That that's at the core of the covenantal process that David Ford and others have. Uh, helped to articulate that our great religious traditions have articulated, uh, and and I think that's uh, uh, what we really have to fight for. <laughs>
perhaps I could, uh, again, I want primarily to say amen once more, but perhaps just a, a, an additional commentary on two points. Uh, you mentioned, of course, the issue of democracy when you were framing the question, Michelle. But I would like to, to recall that democracy is not simply a question of election day. Uh, democracy is something far broader and far deeper, like dignity. Democracy is um, self-governing institutions within a society, whether it's trades unions, whether it's school boards, whether it's mosques, churches, synagogues, whether it's local uh, curling clubs, to speak out of a Canadian institution that I confess I dislike. Um, it really doesn't matter as long as local groups continue to organize and run themselves and appreciate that there will be different perspectives. The, the, the second thing that ties into that is that as a Canadian, I'm certainly a structuralist, a federalist by nature. There is an old uh, joke that three internationals were invited to write a treatise on the elephant. Uh, there was a German treatise in um, uh, three volumes with six volumes of footnotes, a French treatise that said, uh, The Elephant a Gastronomique de l'Arte, and a Canadian who wrote a book entitled The Elephant, a Question of Federal or Provincial Jurisdiction. Canadians <laughs> live, breathe, eat, federalism. But by the same token, um, federalism, even nation states, are not the last word in how human beings will necessarily govern themselves. And then a last anecdote concerning directly that. 30 years ago, uh, Robert Ninian Smart was visiting McGill, and that's a name I'm sure, Syed, you'll be familiar with, perhaps. Um, yeah. He was in the British world a great, um, he was a Carl Sagan of religion in the British world, or the Neil deGrasse Tyson for a new generation. And I was talking to him one evening, we were talking about the nature of the world, and I asked whether or not he foresaw a point at which we would really be able to have a global community that was in some measure self-governing. And Roderick, who was quite a character, but also a very wise man, thought for a moment or two, and he said, I think we will. He said, this of course assumes that the human being, the human species and the planet actually survive our depredations. But he said, I think we will, but if we do, it will come through the back door of nationalism. And I think what he meant, and indeed he did push this further, he said, we are going to, we're never going to have a global community unless those components that make up that global community understand themselves to be uh, accorded the kind of dignity the Cole was just speaking about. Without that, we will continue to have not 192 nations in the UN, but who knows, 384 nations in the UN. People need to believe that they have an expression of their own dignity and their own worth. Nation states are a relatively new invention and were very quickly co-opted by imperialisms and colonialisms, such that the dignity of uh, peoples was entirely lost in the prerogative of nations. And uh, we've a ways to go yet, but we shouldn't assume that the way things are is necessarily the way things are going to be, or even the way things ought to be. And there's the G20 initiative and the uh, work of interreligious dialogue can in a sense go back to the future, rooted in our own covenantal uh, reconciliatory traditions, we can bring those forward to perhaps begin to imagine. Maybe as my, one of my colleagues said, if we can remember the future out of our religious traditions. 